This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. My name is Professor Marnie Hughes-Warrington. I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research and Enterprise here at the University of South Australia. And I'm very pleased to welcome you all here tonight on behalf of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre with this presentation, The Voice, how the final co-design report enables an effective design for Indigenous advice to the parliament and executive government. For tonight's presentation, we're joined by the co-chairs of The Voice co-design senior advisory group, Professor Tom Karma AO and Professor Marcia Langton AO. What an incredible honour. I woke up in a dream and I found myself in the room with the wise. What an extraordinary honour. To start proceedings, we have another honour. I would like to invite Rosemary Wanganeen to deliver Welcome to Country. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you, Marnie. So, also I want to say natural to Dissenter Thompson for inviting me to perform Welcome to Ghana Country at this very special event to hear Tom and Marcia share their thoughts and perspectives on The Voice to Parliament. I would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge all your distinguished guests. It's always an honour and a privilege to perform Welcome to Ghana Country because it gives me an opportunity to formally welcome you all onto Ghana Country. It's also an honour and a privilege to perform them as it enables me to formally recognise my Ghana ancestry and ancestors on my father's side. And on my, on my mother's side, Wirungu ancestry and ancestors from the west coast of South Australia. When performing Ghana Welcomes, I love to bring an educational component and for it to be interactive. For example, let me first explain the meaning of the Ghana words and I'll formally welcome you. And because you are a group of people, I'll do a Ghana group welcome. I'll ask you, Namani, which sounds a little bit like no money, right? <laughs> and Namani is simply asking you, are you all well? And you'll respond with Mani Ardlu. And to help you recall Mani Ardlu, I have a few images to help you remember. So instead of money, Mani. Steel is not soft, it's ard. <laughs> and Lou, well, I'll leave that to your imagination. <laughs> Mani Ard Lou. So when you say Mani Ard Lou back to me, you're simply telling me we are all well. So I'm about to formally welcome you and I invite you to remember those three images. On behalf of myself and my Ghana ancestors, Namani. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so continuing with the educational component, for the city centre of Adelaide, Tandanya is the Ghana word for place of the red kangaroo. And many more aren't aware that Ghana country is far and wide. So if you imagine a wheel with nine spokes and the city of Adelaide is the hub, these spokes approximately extend into the following places. Crystal Brook, which is about two hours north of Adelaide then back down in a southeasterly direction into Clare, which is about one and a half hours from Adelaide. Still in a southerly direction into Gawler, follow the foothills of the Mount Lofty Ranges, continuing in a southerly direction to the south coast, to the Fluro Peninsula, into Cape Jervis, about one and a half hours from Adelaide. And to complete the circle, you'll turn around and head north up the Gulf of St Vincent, bypass Adelaide, Port Wakefield, Port Broughton, and then back into Crystal Brook. Furthermore, many aren't aware that the top of the, of the Mount Lofty Ranges is the country of the Pyramunk people. My welcome always acknowledges my gratitude for the sharing of modern Australia, and I sincerely welcome each and every one of you onto Ghana country. However, I also acknowledge my deepest sadness for the human cost to us as Aboriginal people for this sharing, 
as immense harm has been done and that our Aboriginal ancestors never ceded sovereignty for our traditional lands, seas and waterways or any part of our civilisation. But realising I, and I hope it will always be we, all have a right, a role and a responsibility to be a part of the reconciliation process. Tonight, and every time I do Ghana welcomes, is reconciliation in practice. For those who have gone before us, campaigning for us, we carry their torch so that we can see, feel and hear how far we've come and how, how much further we still have got to go for future generations. But let's not ever forget how far we've come and that can be forgotten. So, as we journey throughout our Australian lives, walking upon Ghana country, our Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal ancestors ask us to tread ever so gently. Our nation of Australians have many cultural identities. So let's continue recognising each other's humanity so that we can continue moving forward as one nation to a place of equity, justice and in partnership together as contemporary Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians. Thank you again for this invitation. And can I just leave you with this thought? We're talking about a referendum. I was 12 years old when the 1967 referendum came into being. Before that, I wasn't a citizen. Neither was my mother or father and my extended family and my people. And that's why it's really important to recognise how far we've come because it was 90, over 90% 90 of the Australian population mainly non-Aboriginal people that voted yes so that I could have what I have today as an Aboriginal person. And I have a lot of faith and trust in the Australian, particularly the non-Aboriginal population, that they will vote yes. And can I just ask, how many people are in this room that voted for the 1967 referendum? I won't ask you yes or no, but who voted? Anybody in this room? Oh, a few hands, fantastic. So there's still some people around who remembers the 1967 refer referendum. And we've got another one coming up. Thank you so much for being here tonight. You can see why Rosemary's an award-winning griefologist. Um, the important thing, yeah, exactly, absolutely. <laughs> Every time Rosemary does a welcome to country, she does this for us in this moment. Uh, your generosity, generosity is extraordinary, but you acknowledge that we have not always been generous back, and I wish to acknowledge that too. Thank you for crediting that we have made progress, but I hear what you say, that we have so much more to do. And tonight is about understanding what we can do together. So thank you, and I said to Rosemary every time she talks, I hear my name, literally. <laughs> it's pretty special. <laughs> thank you, Rosemary. I'd also like to welcome this evening, um, of course, our speakers, Professor Tom Karma and Pre uh, Professor Dr. Marcia Langton AO, Professor Peter Hoy, uh, Vice Chancellor and President, University of Adelaide, and Mandy, thank you for joining us. Um, we have Jane Bang from the City of Mitcham, a counsellor, and University Fellow, former Executive Assistant to the late Honourable Bob Hawke, Jill Saunders. Lovely to see you here, Jill. Now, unfortunately, you're probably wondering, I'm not David Lloyd. Gee, you're clever. That's really good. David can't be with us tonight because he's unwell. So he sends his apologies, um, and I hope it's acceptable to you that you have uh, the DVC here. It's a pretty big, thrilling occasion for me, I have to say. Before we get going, I'd also like to welcome and thank Jacinta Thompson, Executive Director of Events and Ex Exhibitions Producer of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre, and her team. I'd like to thank everybody that's been involved in making this event, this very special event, possible tonight. Tonight's discussion will provide us with an insight into the work that's been undertaken on the co-design of a First Nations voice to Parliament. 
and we're extremely fortunate to have with us the two people that led the consultation on that process, Professor Dr. Marcia Langton and Professor Tom Karma. And we're going to hear from each of them in turn as they talk us through the challenges and the implications of designing an effective model for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander advice to Parliament. The advisory group that was led by Marcia and Tom consulted with over 9,400 people and organisations and their final report notes that through that process they encountered widespread support for the voice among Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians. Now here, more locally, in February, the University of South Australia's academic board voted unanimously to support a First Nations voice. This university has a commitment to Aboriginal education and research, and has always been that way. We have a commitment to participation, advancement, and recognition of Aboriginal innovation and success. And the voice is about that recognition. The concept of the voice is about the principle of recognition of Aboriginal primacy. And that principle is the yes, no question that we put to a referendum should there be a voice enshrined in our constitution? So comments like, oh, we need to see the legislation first, are irrelevant, because ultimately the question is, should there be a voice? Yes or no? It's not a complicated question, but it's the most important question. At its most fundamental, it's about the principle of recognition of Australia's First Nations people in our constitution. A referendum about the voice is a referendum on that principle. This is not about powers, it's about a principle. The principle of enshrining a First Nations voice. So we endorse the principle of a constitutional voice because that's consistent with the mission and commitments and the path of this university. We endorse it as part of our commitment to the advancement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Reflecting that position, I'm delighted to announce that as part of tonight's event, we'll have the great pleasure and honour of presenting Professor Dr Langton and Professor Karma honorary doctorates here at the University of South Australia. These honorary titles recognise a lifetime of work from both Marcia and Tom, and the university is conferring them in a spirit of genuine gratitude and respect for the immense contribution you've both made and that you continue to make. However, before we get all ceremonial, and there will be a robing up, so you've got to stick around for that because it's going to be pretty special. We're going to hear from both Tom and Marcia, each in turn, after which they'll join me in a conversation and answer questions, many of which have been provided by members of tonight's audience. So it's now my extraordinary privilege and pleasure, pleasure to introduce Professor Tom Karma AO. Stay seated because it's quite an amazing intro that I've got to give you. You've got to wait. You've got to let me get through it, okay? Who will discuss the history of voices, the co-design process and final report recommendations, along with the post-karma role of referendum working group and the referendum engagement group. Professor Karma is of Kurungan and Iwaja heritage from the Darwin region. He's currently the Chancellor of the University of Canberra, Professor at the University of Sydney and the National Coordinator for Tackling Indigenous Smoking having previously served as Race Discrimination Commissioner and Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner. He was a senior diplomat, advisor to the Minister of Immigration, Multicultural and Indigenous Affairs, and awarded an Order of Australia in 2012 in recognition of his work in human rights, social justice, and distinguished service to the Indigenous community. I'm also very proud to say he is an alumnus of the University of South Australia. Please join me in welcoming Professor Tom Karma. Um, good evening and, uh, and thank you, Marnie, for your um, stepping in to officiate tonight's uh, proceedings. Before I start, can I thank Auntie Rosemary Wanganeen for your important welcome to country. And on behalf of Marcia and myself, we acknowledge the Ghana peoples who have lived, loved, raised their families and cared for this country for millennia before the arrival of the British that saw the subsequent disposal of the lands, culture and languages across the nation. We'd also like to acknowledge all youth who will be our future leaders and the custodians of our stories, our languages, histories and cultures. 
We emphasise youth because in the 2021 ABS census, 33.2% of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population was under 15 years of age, and this referendum is about the future. I also formally recognise my fellow presenter and collaborator, Professor Marcia Langton AO. It's also great to see so many of you here uh, this evening and to know that we have so many people online. We'll focus our talk tonight on social justice through the lens of the upcoming referendum uh, for the Indigenous Voice to the Parliament of Australia and to the Executive Government. We have titled and themed our presentation, The Voice, How the Final Co-Design Report Enables an Effective Design for Indigenous Advice to the Parliament and the Executive Government. We chose this title in response to the claims that the Government's proposal lacked details and this will influence how people will vote. We believe the information is already available and we note that the current and former governments have endorsed the Cal Melanchthon Final Co-Design Report as guiding the potential structure and operation of the voice. This language might sound a bit wishy-washy, but when we understand the referendum and the subsequent legislation uh, processes, uh, it will become clearer why this is the case. Before I start to delve into the specifics of the theme, I think it's important to recognise some of the history and initiatives that have led us to this point in our shared history and why the referendum evokes so much passionate debate from all sides. The call for a voice actually started soon after the arrival of the first fleet, but I'm not going to go back that far. I'll start from the 1950s. In 1957, the Federal Council for the Advancement of Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders, or FACATSI, was established independently of government. FACATSI um, evolved as a major organisation promoting Indigenous interests from the 1950s. While FACATSI played a central role in the success of the 1967 referendum, its leadership was largely non-Indigenous and this became a very contentious issue. It dissolved soon after the National Aboriginal Consultative Committee, or NACC, was established in 1973. The NACC was the first united national independent uh, Indigenous organisation that represented Indigenous views. The NACC was an advisory body made up of 41 nationally elected Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who, who advised the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs on Aboriginal policy. Following a number of reviews in 1977, a successor body, the National Aboriginal Conference, was established. However, it was abolished in 1984 following the O'Donoghue and Coombs reviews. The NAC was an advisory had an advisory function uh, that the report by Lowich O'Donoghue concluded, produced politicians rather than advisers, had not adequately represented the diversity of Indigenous interests and had not realised coherent policy positions. Further, the body was unable to work with other Indigenous organisations or government departments. The report recommended that a more regionally um, focused organisation be created to give a greater voice to broader Indigenous constituencies. This was backed by a separate report by Nugget Coombs in 1984 that again recommended greater regional representation. In 1988, a Senate Select Committee investigated the proposed Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Bill and suggested over 40 amendments, most of which are uh, incorporated. Subsequently, after 90 amendments were made to the bill during its passage uh, through the Parliament. So you can see that any bill that goes in uh, has the potential to be really amended. And this led in 1989 to the legislation establishment of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, or ATSIC, on the principle that the new organisation should be built around regional mechanisms. Between 1993 and 2003, a number of internal and external initiated reviews of ATSIC were conducted, culminating in the abolition of ATSIC in 2004. The government then established the National Indigenous Council, or the NIC, with 14 members appointed by government as experts with a purely advisory role. They had no representative or consulta, uh, consultation role. In 2007, 
Labor Shadow Minister Macklin announced at the 44th uh, Australian Labor Party National Conference the intention to establish a new national Indigenous representative body. Following the election of the Rudd government, Minister Macklin decided not to reappoint NIC members and on expiry of their term, the NIC was abolished. In February 2008, Prime Minister Rudd, in his apology speech to Parliament, calls for a new partnership with Indigenous people to underpin policy development. And this is where it becomes important. He states that our challenge for the future is to embrace a new partnership between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. The core of this partnership uh, for the future is closing the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians on life expectancy, educational achievement and employment opportunities. This new partnership on closing the gap will set concrete targets for the future. In March 2008, the Labor government and federal opposition signed a statement of intent uh, with the Indigenous health sector for a new partnership to close the gap in life expectancy within a generation. This is 2008. This statement provided bipartisan support to firstly develop a comprehensive long-term plan of action that is targeted to need, evidence-based and capable of addressing the existing inequalities in health services in order to achieve equality of health status and life expectancy between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and non-Indigenous peoples by 2030. Ensure the full participation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and their representative bodies in all aspects of addressing their health needs. Respect and promote the rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and measure, monitor and report on our joint efforts in accordance with benchmarks and targets to ensure that we are progressively realising our shared ambitions. In the Budget 2008-09, um, ministerial statement on closing the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, the Honourable Jenny Macklin stated, the Australian Government's reform agenda, both in uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs and across the Government, is to address the structural and systemic problems that are producing appalling outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Indigenous Australians must be involved in developing and driving solutions. Actions like the National Apology are working to build the trust needed to work together on getting results. Our Closing the Gap commitments require effective engagement with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples at all levels. Government needs to Im involve Indigenous peoples in the design and delivery of programs locally and regionally and share responsibility for outcomes. Solutions development on the grounds must be driven by the communities that will ultimately determine their success or failure. The government went to the election with a commitment to set up a national representative body to provide an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice within government. We will soon begin formal discussions with Indigenous peoples about the role, status and composition of this body. That was 2008 uh, when that statement, so when we're talking voice, we're not talking something that's a recent manifestation. It's been going on for quite a while. As the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner, in July 2008, I presented to the government an issues paper titled Building a Sustainable National Indigenous Representative Body, Issues for Consideration. An extract from that, uh, from the introduction of the issues paper stated that, barely a day goes by without another chilling and heartbreaking story of abuse, violence or neglect, or of demonstrations of the impact of entrenched poverty and despair amongst our communities. Without proper engagement with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, governments will struggle in their efforts to make lasting progress in improving the conditions of Indigenous peoples and in our communities. Further, in a speech I presented to the National Native Title Conference in 2008, I said, much of the failure of service delivery to Indigenous peoples and communities and the lack of sustainable outcomes is a direct result of failure to engage appropriately with Indigenous people and of the failure to support and build capacity of Indigenous communities. It is the result of a failure to develop priorities and programs in full participation with Indigenous communities. Put simply, governments risk failure and will continue to do so if they develop and implement policies about Indigenous issues without engaging with the intended recipients of those services. 
Bureaucrats and governments can have the best intentions in the world, but if their ideas have not been subject to the reality test of the life experience of the local Indigenous peoples who are the intended beneficiaries of these services, then government efforts will fail. The need for participation exists at the local, regional and national level. Processes are needed to ensure Indigenous inputs in a systemic manner at the regional level and linked up to the state and national levels. Again, this was said way back in 2008. In August 2008, the Australian Government allocated funds to commence uh, consultations with Indigenous peoples on the establishment of a new Indigenous representative body. As the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner, I was appointed to lead the consultations. To cut a long story short, following extensive consultations and a deliberative dialogue that took place here in Glenelg with 100 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from across the nation, the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples was formed as a uh, public company limited by guarantee um, that followed in November 2009. And establishment funding was provided by the Labor government. However, a change of government and lack of subsequent funding forced the National Congress to go into voluntary administration in June 2019. So friends, you can see that there's been a chequered history of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's attempts to establish a national voice and have meaningful engagement with governments and bureaucrats on matters that affect us. We have been the passive recipients of government policies and programs that have mostly not addressed the wicked problems that confront us. Over the past 65 years, we've had successive national representative bodies created and funded by the community and non-government sector, as well as government-initiated and funded representative bodies. There have been voluntary bodies, incorporated entities, a company limited by guarantee, a grants-funded entity, and entities created by legislation. These roles have also varied, as has their impact on policies and programs, and uh, constant has been uh, the regular review of our structures and our operations. We are now at the cusp of substantial and sustainable change in a political and community environment that is conducive to consider and support such change. So let's explore where we're at and address the theme of today, the voice, how the final co-design report enables an effective design for Indigenous advice to the parliament and executive government. I'll also unpack, unpack some of the myths and misinformation and what is needed to get the referendum over the line. To address some of the myths and misinformation currently in circulation, and this is not all of them, but just some of them, I'll pose the question or state the claim and respond accordingly. The first issue, is the Uluru Statement from the Heart and the referendum for a voice the same thing? The Statement from the Heart references three key reforms, voice, treaty, truth. The statement calls for the establishment of a First Nations voice entrenched in the Constitution. The proposed referendum will only be about, and this is important, about amending the Australian Constitution to enable the establishment of the voice to Parliament and the Executive Government. It is about the Commonwealth Parliament, Commonwealth Government departments and entities, and Commonwealth legislation. It will have no influence or involvement with state and territory affairs unless invited to by the relevant authorities. The referendum will not address truth or treaty. Truth and treaty um, um, at the national level will commence after the referendum is held. However, at the state and territory level, processes have commenced with treaty discussions occurring in Tasmania, New South Wales, Queensland and SA. Treaty commissions have been established in the Northern Territory and Victoria, and just yesterday, Queensland, uh, Queensland's path to treaty was set into law with the passing of landmark legislation. Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk said, all Queenslanders will benefit from a reconciled Queensland, and we are committed to working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people towards reconciliation, truth-telling and healing, and reframing our relationship. Victoria is the most advanced jurisdiction because they've enacted the Advancing the Treaty Process with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Victorians Act 2018, the establishment of a voice mechanism known as the First People's Assembly of Victoria 
in 2019 and a truth-telling mechanism called the, the Uruk Justice Commission in 2021. And as we know, South Australia now has a legislative voice and I'm confident that other jurisdictions will soon follow yours, Victoria's and Queensland's lead. A second question, why do we need to have this referendum? The referendum is a chance for our First Nations people to be recognised in the Constitution and enshrining an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice gives strength and status to the principles of respect and partnership. We need a voice so that future governments will make better policies that will make a practical difference to First Nations peoples. The voice will mean that First Nations peoples will be advising government when decisions are made about laws and policies impacting on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. It will heal our nation and lead to better policies and practices uh, and, and practical outcomes as First Nations people know what governments need to do when it comes to things like education, health, housing and family violence. Now this is a once in a generational opportunity to change our constitution and place our nation on a pathway for a better future. It also creates an element of redress post the 1992 High Court decision to overturn the fiction of Terranalius by uh, recognising Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the Constitution. So how will the Constitution change? The voice would be a representative advisory body enshrined in the Constitution. The question to be put to the Australian people in the 2023 referendum will be, and I quote, a proposed law to alter the Constitution to recognise the First Peoples of Australia by establishing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. And simply, do you approve this proposed alteration? That's all that's going to be presented to you when you go to vote at the referendum. The proposed law that Australians are being asked to approve at the referendum would insert a new section into the Constitution. It'll be Chapter 9, Recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander People, Section 129, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Voice. In recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Peoples as the First Peoples of Australia, there shall be a body to be called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Voice. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Voice may make representation to the Parliament and the Executive Government of the Commonwealth on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Peoples. The Parliament shall, subject to this Constitution, have powers to make laws with respect to matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, voice, including the composition, function, powers and procedures. So one is about what the people uh, have responsibility for and what the other is about what the, the government has responsibility for. The process to arrive at the referendum question and the proposed constitutional change were guided by the referendum working group uh, that Marcy and I are both members of, that is made up of more than 20 First Nations leaders who advise government on how best to deliver a successful referendum to enshrine an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice in the Constitution. We also had a constitutional expert group uh, which comprised of former High Court uh, judges and, and uh, also constitutional experts. Uh, they assisted us and, and the government in reaching um, the, the formal legal positions. If successful, the government will then propose a bill, or we often call it legislation, but legislation is what comes out, the bill is what goes in, uh, to address the voice composition, function, powers and procedures. That will be tabled at the, um, in the House of Representatives where it will be debated and typically referred to a joint parliamentary committee for public consultations. It is at this stage, after the referendum, that we will get to know the details and if past history is an indicator, as I mentioned earlier, the introduced bill will be amended multiple times so that what is proposed is not necessarily what will eventuate. But that's our democratic process. Now, we've also heard that uh, a number of pundits are suggesting that the voice is not needed because there are 11 First Nations representatives in Parliament. Parliamentarians are elected to represent all of their constituents and parties, not just First Nations peoples, and to make decisions about issues impacting all Australians. First Nations parliamentarians bring with them an insight into the issues affecting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that others do not. But ultimately, 
they represent their state or electorate. Also, First Nations parliamentarians are an instrument of the political parties uh, that got them in with positions on a broad range of issues impacting Australians. Uh, and their views may be uh, impacted by the party, not solely by the First Nations peoples who they represent. The exception to that are the independents who, who are um, in there. The First Nations parliamentarians cannot, nor should they be expected to, represent all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voices in Australia. And whilst there are currently 11 First Nations representatives to Parliament, there is no guarantee that this will remain the same in the next term of Parliament. Permanent change uh, that is not um, party politically driven is needed to deliver better outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And I'll, I'll just draw an example closer to home uh, that you might um, uh, be, be familiar with, and that's the example of political influence, is the treaty movement of South Australia that was put on ice in 2018 uh, with the change of government and is still thawing. Now, you'll all remember there was also the original claim uh, they're still being promoted by opponents that the voice will operate like a third or fourth chamber of parliament. The Prime Minister has said the voice would not have the veto over decisions of parliament. It will be an unflinching source of advice and accountability, not a third chamber, nor have a rolling veto. The body will be an advisory body. It will have no ability to hinder parliamentary process. It will not have any veto powers and could not introduce legislation or change it. The parliament will be under no obligation to follow the voice's advice. The House of Representatives and the Senate will continue to make laws, regulations and pass motions, uh, regardless of what the voice may advise. Now, there are a vast array of advisory bodies to the government that you may or may not be familiar with, uh, and to the parliament, covering all sorts of issues. They include the Auditor General, the Australian National Audit Office, the Australian Law Reform Commission, the Australian Human Rights Commission and the Commonwealth Ombudsman, whose reports are all tabled in Parliament. This is just the, the, the democratic process that, we, uh, that we're faced with. But we also know that their reports aren't always taken up. Neither are a lot of the, 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 the joint parliamentary committee reports where you'll have uh, the government will have the majority say, you'll have minority reports, often they just get shelled. So we spend a lot of time collecting data and, and writing reports, but uh, not a lot of them come to fruition. And it doesn't matter what the aspirations of politicians are, and we heard about a few of them earlier, um, you know, that doesn't mean it's going to translate into, into um, anything meaningful, and that's why we're proposing that it goes beyond just a legislative approach and go into the um, you know, into the Constitution. Now, you'll also note that former High Court judges and constitutional law exports, e experts, maybe they should be exports, um, <laughs> uh, support, some of them should, anyhow, uh, support their claims, uh, support the claims that the Prime Minister's made and, and what's in our um, uh, question, um, but others won't. And we'll always get that situation where, where others will want to, you know, some will, some will be positive, some will be not so positive. Social media and some Indigenous commentators claim that not all Indigenous peoples support the voice. Well, this is true, as there are a wide range of views amongst First Nations peoples. Just like any group of Australians, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are diverse and don't all think the same way, and we aren't all the same across the nation. However, the voice proposal is the result of successive processes of consultation and engagement involving thousands of individuals and engaging with communities across the country. As I cited earlier, First Nations leaders have been calling for this reform for decades. And I'm confident there is an overwhelming support within the, the First Nations communities, with, uh, which will only grow as, as we get closer to the referendum. The other is that there's not enough detail, and I've kind of covered off on this, um, you know, and, and you know, the claim that it's like signing a blank cheque. Well, there have been a number of reports on constitutional recognition and the voice model. Most recently, the model Professor Langton and I put forward in the Indigenous Voice Co-Design Final Report 2021. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, any detail really, because 
um, that'll be stealing Marcia's thunder, and she'll um, she'll elaborate on this um, in a few minutes' time. Details relating to the voice are being further discussed with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples through the First Nations engagement process established by Minister Burney and a civics education and information dissemination campaign uh, that will commence shortly with the whole of the population. And it's important to, to note that the National Indigenous Australians Agency has just launched a new website, www.voice.gov.au. And that's a go-to um, go reference point for accurate information and, uh, and, and up-to-date information. So I'd urge you to check that one out. Over the coming months, both the yes and no campaigns will be filling the airways with information that will be challenging uh, to navigate, but my advice is to not lose sight of the fact that if we want to see sustainable and su substantial change, we need to listen to and, and, uh, and meaningfully engage with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And remember, there will be an appropriate oversight um, you know, for the Australian people on the details of the voice through the normal parliamentary processes. It will be established by legislation um, that will be considered by the parliament and subject to the normal parliamentary scrutiny and debate. And that's the legislation that'll follow the successful referendum. Another claim, and this is another big one, that, it'll be, that, we, that um, this voice will divide us by race and it will give First Nations people uh, more rights than others. Well, this is not about uh, race politics or dividing Australians. It's about uniting Australia and making our nation stronger. The voice is not about special rights, it's a basic right. All Australians will remain equal in the eyes of the law. The only thing that changes is that there will be a permanent new body to provide advice on Commonwealth laws, policies and programs that affect First Nations peoples. And um, you might ask some questions of that. I'm sure Marcy will, would love to, to um, elaborate. Now, we don't need to change the constitution is another claim. You just set up an advisory body. Well, as I open tonight, First Nations people have had legislated bodies in the past, with the most prominent being ATSEC. Uh, the issue of recognising Australia's First Nations in the Constitution has been considered and debated for more than a decade now by the Australian public, parliamentary committees, constitutional experts and First Nations leaders and communities. Legislation alone cannot create a permanent partnership or enduring change to improve outcomes for First Nations people. It is important to recognise Australia's First Nations peoples who have been on this continent for over 65,000 years who are, and who have historically been excluded from Australia's constitution. For too long, the process of how First Nations people are heard has been determined by the whims of ever-changing governments. An enshrined voice will be a permanent means to partner and advise the Australian Parliament and government on the views of First Nations peoples on matters that are important to them. We'll also have, as I described, all those other mechanisms at the, the jurisdictional level that will complement what's happening at the national level. There is much more that I could say, but my time is up. I've endeavoured to demonstrate that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have, for over 65 years, attempted to have a voice that could guide government and parliament on how to effectively design and implement policies and programs that will have a positive impact to achieve equality for all First Nations Australia. We are experiencing advancements, yes, but not at the pace experienced by other Australians. And this is, this is an important one, and this is why the gap's not closing. It's not because we're not achieving, it's just that non-Indigenous population is also achieving, and so we're running parallel. And so the gap won't change unless there's a major change in the way that we, we design and develop and fund our programs. I've also endeavoured to shine a light on the way forward and how all voting populations need to become informed of the facts and not be swayed by the myths and misinformation that are being promoted by pundits who are ill-informed or have malice intent. Now, Marcia will now elaborate on the co-design uh, process and the local and regional voice structure as described in our final uh, co-design report. Thank you.
Thank you, Tom. It is time to listen, isn't it? It's been a long time coming. Well, I would now like to welcome Professor Dr Marcia Langton, who will discuss how the national voice will be potentially complemented by regional voice arrangements as recommended in the final co-design report. Anthropologist, geographer, academic, Professor Langton is a descendant of the Yemen and the Bidjara nations of Queensland. She's devoted her career to advancing the interests of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Since 2000, she's held the Foundation Chair of Australian Indigenous Studies at the University of Melbourne, where she also serves as Associate Provost. Professor Dr Langton's advocacy career began in 1977 when she served as the General Secretary of the Federal Council for Advancement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. She made a significant contribution to the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, authoring the report, Too Much Sorry Business. She was a member of the Aboriginal Negotiating Panel, influencing the passage of the Native Title Act through the Federal Parliament in 1993. Please join me in welcoming Professor Dr Marcia Langton. Good evening all. Uh, thank you, Auntie Rosemary Wanganine, for welcoming me to your country. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, introducing me, Marnie, um, and thank you, Tom. I will also acknowledge the Garner traditional owners, the elders, and the young leaders who are cutting their teeth now in Indigenous affairs in their communities and in their family networks, striving to find a place of dignity for themselves and others in the vexed landscape of Australia, where the First Peoples remain without constitutional recognition and where most Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are disadvantaged or extremely disadvantaged. So I will discuss how the regional voice arrangements uh, could work as recommended in our final co-design report and uh, their relationship to the national voice. In announcing the constitutional amendment that will be put to the Australian people later this year, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has asked all Australians to vote on the principle of the voice. The wording of the amendment developed in consultation with the, our, our referendum working group seems relatively simple, but what it represents is profound. More than symbolic recognition, the voice would bring about meaningful change for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. It was the call of the Uluru Statement from the Heart that brought this idea into mainstream awareness. That statement made it clear that meaningful recognition for our peoples means a fairer say in the policies and laws that impact us. Those on the conservative side of politics agreed. Recognition should involve more than symbolic gestures. The inclusion of the First Peoples in the nation should be gauged through tangible measures that improve health, education, economic participation, and, for instance, reduce rates of incarceration. Or, as the late chairman of the Yothiindi Foundation, Dr Yunapingu, said at the University of Melbourne in 2007, in a speech that set out the goal of constitutional recognition, words can set the scene, but real commitments are required to tackle poverty and disadvantage. This is why the detail is important. The voice needs to be designed in a way that enables grassroots solutions to be heard. Productive ways of working together must become the norm. The Albanese government has also announced a set of design principles, which were developed through our extensive consultations in the voice co-design process. In summary, these are, the voice will give independent advice to the parliament and government, the voice will be chosen by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people based on the wishes of local communities. The voice will be representative of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, gender balanced and include youth. 
The voice will be empowering, community-led, inclusive, respectful, and culturally informed. The voice will be accountable and transparent. The voice will work alongside exi existing organisations and traditional structures. The voice will not have a program delivery function. The voice will not have a veto power. So as I said, these principles approved by government are a version of the nine principles developed in our Indigenous Voice co-design process from 2019 to 2021 and unanimously adopted by the other 50 people who were members of our working groups. The principle of constitutional enshrinement is also an important one, providing much needed stability and certainty. The Law Council of Australia has written that an Indigenous voice constitutionally enshrined is a manifestation of the right to self-determination or our right to take responsibility. It enables the aspirations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to be considered as legitimate and taken seriously within our shared national project. These principles are fundamentally important. However, our talk of principles has led some to make the spurious claim that there is a lack of details to support our case for change. This argument, on which much of the no case depends, is simply untrue. The detail is there. On the one hand, they say there's no detail, and on the other hand, they say, I shouldn't have to read a 300-page report. <laughs> Australians from all walks of life and political persuasion have been involved in the design and consultation process of our voice co-design report. But as Tom has explained, we have been working on it for years. The no case, on the other hand, has not produced any alternative or detailed models. To claim that there is a lack of detail polarises the debate, turning it into a culture war. We are told by the no case that the voice is really about the aspirations of a liberal elite, that we have taken a principled position rather than a pragmatic one and lost our footing. They call it a Canberra voice that is distanced from the real issues on the ground. Nothing could be further from the truth. I hope to dispel this notion by introducing you to some of the details proposed in our report. When you vote in the referendum, you'll be asked a broad question. Should the constitution be altered to recognise the first peoples of Australia by establishing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice? We are being asked to vote on the principle of the voice. But this principle is best understood through its local and regional functions, in the ways that it will work to empower local communities. The meaning and significance of the voice should be understood through this detail. In 2018, the Australian government initiated a process to co-design the voice with First Nations people. In October 2020, a broadly representative working group of 52 people from around the country delivered an interim report to the government and federal opposition. Australians from across the country were invited to provide their feedback. We consulted over 9,400 people and organisations. Many organisations, councils, and other kinds of bodies participated in the consultation process led by our co-design members. This marked one of the most significant engagement with the Australian community on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs in recent history. There were also written submissions from thousands of people and webinars and other online forums with associations and councils invol involving Australians from all walks of life. Over four months, we had conversations across urban, regional and remote Australia. We were fortunate to engage with people from 115 community consultation sessions in 67 diverse communities and more than 120 stakeholder meetings around the country. We also gathered feedback online with more than 4,000 written submissions and survey responses put forward by both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and non-Indigenous people, communities and organisations. 
Our final report summarised the work of 18 months and set out a proposal for both local and regional voices and a national voice designed to work together in delivering the most effective and relevant advice to all levels of government. The wording to be included in the Constitution, should the referendum pass, is currently being worked out by the government with submissions made by parliamentary inquiry. Their report is due next week on the 15th of May. If the referendum passes, it is up to our government and parliament to determine the composition, functions, powers and procedures of the voice. Future Australian parliaments would continue to develop and adjust the workings of the voice so that it remains relevant, effective and accountable. As former Chief Justice, Murray Gleeson explained, the voice would be constitutionally entrenched, but legislatively controlled. In our final report, we wrote that the purpose of an Indigenous voice is to create a strong, resilient and flexible system in which Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and our communities will be part of genuine, shared decision-making with governments at the local and regional level and have our voices heard by the Australian Parliament and government in policy and lawmaking. By being involved in genuine shared decision-making with governments at a local and regional level, we can more effectively address complex issues related to education, health and employment outcomes, and the many other challenges we face as First Peoples, such as effective cultural heritage protection, revitalisation of our languages, economic development, and effective Indigenous governance and leadership in the community native title and community control sectors. Despite years of policies and metrics on closing the gap, many of these outcomes are only getting worse. We are able to report only a few successes in overcoming disadvantages. And these few are the result of Indigenous innovation and persistence. And indeed, it is important to mention here tonight that Tom Calmer was the founder of the first Closing the Gap model and methodology. While the media has focused on the workings of a national voice to parliament and the executive functions of government, a large proportion of our final report was dedicated to these local and regional components. These voices were strongly supported by feedback during the consultation phase. And I should add that I feel a personal responsibility to all those hundreds of people that I spoke to, and I know that other members of our uh, voice co-design groups also feel this responsibility to remind governments and Australians of what we were told and uh, how strongly people uh, feel about this. Local and regional voices would be designed in different ways around the country to best address local needs, concerns, histories, demography and cultures. Representation on a national voice would be structurally linked to these local and regional voices and reflect a broad range of experiences and aspirations from across the country. It is clear that what improves people's lives is when they get a say. And that's what this is about. We want to empower communities to speak for themselves. During one community consultation in Cairns, a member of the public commented that representation should not only be inclusive and balanced, but should listen to these quiet voices. Local and regional components of a voice should be designed to enable these quiet voices to be heard. We believe that hearing the quiet voices is essential to the effectiveness of the voice and also to our sense of wholeness as a nation. It is difficult for these quiet voices to be heard. It is unusual if they are reported in the mainstream media. This is why the no case campaigners, such as opposition leader Peter Dutton, Senator Jacinta Price and Warren Mundine, are able to deceive the public with their misrepresentations about how the voice is the concern of, a, allegedly, a Canberra elite, allegedly a waste of money, and they also allege not capable of leading to practical outcomes. Their most egregious misrepresentation is that the referendum question, if successful, will lead to racial division. The plain fact is that it is the Constitution that is racist. 
Peter Dutton, Senator Price, Warren Mundine and others will continue to mislead Australians about the Constitution and about the question to be put to them in the referendum. They will not acknowledge the racism in Australia's Constitution at section 5126 and section 25. They refuse to admit to their fellow Australians that the referendum question, if successful, will lead, to, will lead to the establishment of an advisory body to parliament and government that will remediate this racism by enabling the parliament and executive government to receive the advice of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in relation to matters that affect them. It is actually the no case campaigners who are inciting racism. The majority of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, including those who work at the front line to change the appalling conditions in remote Australia, say they are wrong. They know they are wrong. These are the people who are sick of the rhetoric and the life-wasting, money-wasting, top-down approach of government after government. In April, 90 leaders of the Central Land Council, representing dozens of remote communities in Central Australia, issued a joint statement rejecting the views of Senator Jacinta Price. They said she needs to stop pretending we are, we are her people. They represent about 24,000 Aboriginal people speaking more than 15 languages across 777,000 square kilometres in Central Australia. They said Senator Price neither speaks for them nor listens to them. They said, as reported in The Guardian, that they are sick of Price's continued attacks on land councils and other peak Aboriginal organisations in the Northern Territory. Last week, Dr Jumbawa Marawili, leader of the Yithawa Marapa clan of the Yolngu people in North East Arnhem Land, stood on his sacred Yingapungapu Ngara ground and spoke to the nation. He sent a message of support for the Indigenous Voice to Parliament and to the Executive Government to the Parliament down south in Canberra. His homeland is extremely remote and he has advocated for decades for services for his people. He said in this video published in The Guardian again, I speak in my parliament. My voice must be heard in your parliament. Our voice is our life, alive on this country. We are strongly supporting them, that is, those who are trying to achieve the voice. He understands the need for a formal representative process, constitutionally entrenched, pre precisely because of the many obstacles he faced as a clan leader over decades, speaking to politicians in the territory and federal governments year after year with insufficient outcomes in practical terms. He understands the concept of the formality of a voice because his traditional Yingapungapu Ngara is the equivalent of the Canberra Parliament, much more ancient of course, but a supreme governing body for his people. Other Yolngu leaders have also spoken in the support of the voice, such as Professor Brian Gumbler of the Indigenous Knowledge Institute and his wife Ranel Gondara, who spoke last week at the University of Melbourne about how answers to the poverty and exclusion in remote communities such as their own elude most political commentators. They spoke about how Indigenous elders in remote Australia nonetheless work tirelessly to provide for their communities and can achieve better outcomes if only people would listen to them. Our proposal recommended that local and regional voices would be community-led, community-designed and community-run. We made it clear that the principle of self-determination must be respected in the development of the regional voice arrangements. They would be developed differently on, depending on location and context, but should align with the nine guiding principles we agreed to, such as gender equity, inclusive participation and evidence-based decision-making. Legislation should set out minimum expectations for these voices, as well as transparency and accountability principles. Our final report proposes between 25 and 35 local and regional voice regions across Australia be established. This number is flexible, of course, and should be determined by further consultation. In each region, 
on matters such as cultural groupings and existing representative bodies. Regions would align with state and territory boundaries. However, cross-border arrangements would be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. And here in South Australia, of course, you know, you have the very uh, wonderful Ngunnathara Pijanjara, Yunkanjajara Women's Council or NPY Women's Council that uh, provides services and Aboriginal governance across three jurisdictions, South Australia, Northern Territory and, and Western Australia for those three language groups and they serve women, youth and men uh, and provide services that governments can't or won't provide. They advise for governments. The design of local and regional voices will differ between regions. This flexibility is necessary for local and regional voices to effectively work alongside established processes and bodies. So for instance, uh, you know, I, I, I wait with interest to see, should we be successful in the referendum, what happens with the South Australian voice, um, which seems to be, have been designed in accordance with our report in many respects. Um, so in one region, uh, the local or regional voice might establish a representative council elected by the indigenous residents of that area. That's the case in the ACT, where the ACT Indigenous Elected Assembly has been uh, a formal feature uh, of uh, the parliament uh, there for many years. Uh, this council might also include members nominated by local community organisations, uh, such as Aboriginal Health and legal services. Uh, they would meet to discuss Indigenous priorities for service delivery in the region, appointing an executive group to represent these concerns to local government bodies, as well as seeking input through community forums. In another area, an established assembly of senior traditional owners might develop a parallel assembly for young and emerging leaders. Together, they could receive representations from community working parties formed to canvas responses on specific issues impacting the region. The Empowered Communities Project, who today launched their own information booklet on The Voice, represent at least nine regions of Australia that differ culturally and geographically, and yet their leaders have agreed for a number of years to a common purpose, good governance and representation to ensure that their communities thrive. There are other such areas that have long developed local and regional voice arrangements that are already working. And the South Australian voice is no exception. There's also the Torres Strait Regional Authority and the Murdy Parkey Council in Western New South Wales. So the South Australian voice, along with the Victorian First Peoples Assembly and a few others that I've mentioned, are the most in advanced, but the first two are legislated and they have an assured mandate, mandate and process so that local and regional voices are heard. We look forward to state and territory governments being able to take advice from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the same way that this will occur here. In our report, we recommended that these local and regional voices should provide advice to all levels of government on community aspirations, priorities and challenges to influence policy program and service responses draw on knowledge of local Indigenous organisations and sector experts to develop advice and enhance their voice to governments, provide advice to non the non-government sector, for, is, for instance, uh, non-government organisations, charitable foundations and so on, and business uh, and, and corporations. We were mindful of the fact that Tom's already mentioned that more than 70% of the National Indigenous Affairs budget is allocated to the states and territories to expend on a range of practical applications. Only a minor part of the budget remains in the Commonwealth domain for federal parliaments to departments to allocate to programs. This is one of the key reasons for our emphasis on the regional and local voices. 
They are fundamental to improving the lives of Aboriginal people because they will be critical to the local and regional priority setting and decision-making processes aimed at doing so. And we also predict that they will save a lot of money by uh, preventing duplication and wasteful spending. Our recommended approach is consistent with a range of government commitments and policy directions, including the priority reforms in the National Agreement on Closing the Gap. Say, for instance, priority reform one, formal partnerships and shared decision making. Local and regional voices would be required to develop respectful long-term partnerships between all levels of government. This would be achieved by facilitating opportunities for individuals, leaders, family groups and organisations to contribute to regional decision-making processes. Importantly, we have recommended that these voices will not displace or undermine bodies with existing statutory roles or specific functions, but provide links for involvement. Their work should begin by building on what is already working well in regions across Australia. It's also worth noting that local and regional voices we recommended would not administer funding or programs. Talking with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, listening to their views, valuing their expertise and acting on their advice are all essential to developing effective, productive and fair laws and policies. This is relevant, particularly in practice, because Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are the only people in Australia for whom laws are made exclusively on the basis of race. Our people navigate laws made exclusively about them in relation to things like native title, cultural heritage and environmental management. Further, legacies of colonial settlement and racist policies, such as those relating to the stolen generations, continue to have a detrimental impact on First Nations communities and families. For instance, there is a profound lack of trust in relation to child welfare and family services in many communities. Uh, 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 I add that there's a profound lack of trust in government. Effective policymakers need to consider these distinctive issues and be well informed by local First Nations people who know their communities and their needs. Governance models need to become more responsive to the needs of Indigenous Australians to circumvent compounding injustices. Minister for Indigenous Australians Linda Burney has often said that the voice is about drawing a line on the poor outcomes from the long legacy of failed programs and broken policies and listening to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. She said, things like incarceration and child removal, housing, health and education outcomes. The voice is about making sure that what happens in the federal parliament is going to be a positive step forward, both in terms of us as a nation, but also the life outcomes for First Nations people in Australia. Wherever we went, we were reminded of the harm that's been caused to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people by government interventions, particularly the Northern Territory emergency intervention, the threat by, that was under Prime Minister John Howard, the threat by Prime Minister Tony Abbott to close down 500 communities, um, some of which he did succeed in cooperation with Premier Barnett in closing and even bulldozing, and many other acts of harm that are well remembered in all the Aboriginal communities we, we went to. Our proposal seeks to close the gap between politicians and government departments who make the policy and local communities whose experience whose experiences those policy makers largely do not share. There is a general lack of awareness of the actual nature of the bureaucratic machinery of Indigenous affairs. This bureaucracy exists to measure, categorise and report. It is administered largely by well-paid public servants. Their business is to write memos and reports. 
If they do activate the check writing processes in their bureaucracy, they do so more often to pay the army of consultants producing feasibility reports and evaluations. I receive letters and emails from people of goodwill trying to do something positive and who have tried to engage with the Indigenous Affairs machine. They come away with scathing views of the roundabout of bureaucrats, agencies, websites, application forms and absurd meetings. I have talked to Aboriginal people who have registered with an agency to find employment. Their stories are accounts of Kafkaesque horror. Compounding this situation, policies often carry incorrect ideas and assumptions about Indigenous people that constrain human and economic potential. Our futures are confined by the narrow imaginings of those who are elected to um, govern for allegedly for all Australians, but so often not for us. Member for Victoria Park in the Parliament of Western Australia some years ago, Ben Wyatt, spoke of the palliative economics that hold Aboriginal people back from participating on an equal footing. In his first speech, he went on to become the Treasurer of the state and at one stage Assistant Premier. In his first speech to Parliament, he stated that those of us fortunate enough not to experience real poverty are often confused by what this word means. It simply does not mean material deprivation. Poverty of the kind that is passed from generation to generation is exclusion, a lack of power and respect that is more often than not inflicted upon people who are controlled and bullied by the welfare machine. As an Aboriginal man who grew up in Western Australia, he well understood this. He described palliative economics as the suffocating atmosphere of the welfare state, the protectionist state that addresses itself to an old paradigm of the mendicant natives. Such ideas which have been foisted onto us by those in positions of power, entrench disadvantage, blunt self-esteem and restrict prosperity. And nothing could have been more obvious than, uh, in, in relation to that than the ham-fisted implementation by the Department of Social Security of income quarantining, forced income quarantining. The voice is an opportunity to turn this around from words about us to hearing directly from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people about what it matters to them. This is not about giving some people a greater say than others based on their race. There is no presumption of a singular Indigenous point of view. And we are certainly not arguing that the discredited pseudoscience of racial difference should play any role in our liberal democracy. Instead, by acknowledging our diverse histories, and in our case, one that goes back 65,000 years, stories, experiences and challenges, we can begin to work more effectively together. And so I encourage you to be well informed and to support us by voting yes in the referendum. Thank you. Time to acknowledge the harm and to hear the quiet voice. Thank you, Marcia, so much for those powerful words. Um, you've given us a detailed look inside the co-design process for the First Nations Voice to Parliament, and I hope we can continue the conversation to come. And I think it's very clear to everybody here tonight that the advisory group that you have led across Australia, listening to so many communities, so many individuals, has been tasked with something utterly extraordinary. And you are extraordinary people to have done this and to have taken this on the journey and shown extraordinary generosity, openness, and extraordinary patience. What a profound opportunity. <laughs> we want you to just sit tight. Now you'll understand that academic dress is a little complex, but please stay in your seats for a couple of minutes as we robe up and we're going to switch gears and I'm going to invite the Deputy Chancellor, uh, the Honourable John Hill, to preside in the conferring of two extraordinarily special honorary degrees. So please stay here while we go and gown ourselves up and we'll be back in just a minute.
To conclude tonight's event, it gives me great pleasure to present Professor Tom Karma AO and Professor Dr. Marcia Langton AO for the honorary award of Doctor of the University. And this is going to be conferred by UniSA's Deputy Chancellor, the Honourable John Hill, who will do the conferral. Deputy Chancellor. The University of South Australia awards the honorary degree of Doctor of the University to a person of eminence who's made a distinguished contribution to public service or a field of academic endeavour or artistic pursuit. It is my great pleasure, firstly, to present Professor Tom Karma for the honorary degree of Doctor of the University in recognition of his distinguished service to the community. Professor Tom Karma AO is an elder of the Kurungan people and member of the Uweji people and has been involved in Indigenous affairs at a local, community, state, national and international level for 40 years. Born in Darwin, Tom moved to Adelaide to study an Associate Diploma of Social Work at the University of South Australia Institute of Technology, one of UniSA's antecedent institutions, and upon graduating in 1978, led the creation of the Aboriginal Task Force at the Darwin Community College. Beginning with that role, Tom has worked tirelessly for the improvement and advancement of Indigenous peoples' health, justice, education and employment. Tom has served in positions within Australia relating to Indigenous and mainstream employment, community development and education, and as Senior Advisor to the Minister of Immigration, Multicultural and Indigenous Affairs. Internationally, he has worked as a Senior Australian Diplomat in India and Vietnam, representing Australia's interests in education and training from 1995 to 2002. Tom was Aboriginal on Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner at the Australian Human Rights Commission from 2004 to 2010 and also served as Race Discrimination Commissioner from 2004 until 2009. In 2005, Tom authored the Social Justice Report, which called for the life expectancy gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people to be closed within a generation and laid the groundwork for the Close the Gap campaign. Tom chaired the Close the Gap Steering Committee for Indigenous Health Equality since its inception in March 2006 and retired as co-chair in 2011. The Close the Gap campaign has effectively brought national attention to achieving health equality for Indigenous people by 2030 and National Close the Gap Day is celebrated on 24th or 25th of March each year. In 2010, Tom was appointed National Coordinator for Tackling Indigenous Smoking to lead the fight against tobacco use in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. He was appointed an Officer of the Order of Australia in 2012, named as ACT Australian of the Year in 2013 for his work as Human Rights and Social Justice Advocate and named Senior Australian of the Year for 2023. Tom is currently Chancellor of the University of Canberra, Professor at the University of Sydney, and remains an active researcher with interests including pharmacological application for scabies control, genomics, indigenous cancers, and tobacco control, mental health, and suicide prevention. He's a member of the Australian Genomics Independent Advisory Board, the Australian Medical Research Advisory Board, and co-chair of Reconciliation Australia. He was an awardee of the inaugural UniSA Alumni Awards in 2015 and is patron of the UniSA Deadly Alumni Association. <laughs> in 2019, Tom was appointed as co-chair of the Senior Advisory Group of the Design Process for a Permanent Indigenous Advisory Body to Parliament, building on many decades as fierce advocate for progress and change in Australia and beyond. Deputy Chancellor, on behalf of the University of South Australia, I am pleased to present Thomas Edwin Karma AO for the honorary award of Doctor of the University in recognition of distinguished service to the community. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hughes Warrington. On behalf of the University of South Australia, I confer on you Thomas Edwin Karma the honorary award of Doctor of the University. <laughs> Deputy Chancellor, 
It is now my great pleasure to present Professor Dr. Marcia Lynn Langton AO for the honorary degree of Doctor of the University in recognition of her distinguished service to the community. Professor Dr. Marcia Langton AO is of the Yemen and Bidjaran nations and widely recognised as a major figure in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander advocacy. Born in Brisbane, Marcia became politically active at a young age, partly in response to the discrimination she encountered in the Queensland education system. After a period travelling the world, she relocated to Sydney to work with the Aboriginal Medical Service and co-founded the Black Women's Action Group and co-published the newspaper Kuri Bina. In 1977, Marcia was elected General Secretary of the Federal Council for the Advancement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, relocating to Canberra, where she also studied at the Australian National University, becoming the first Aboriginal Honours Graduate in Anthropology. During her time at ANU, Marcia worked as consultant on customary law with the Australian Law Reform Commission and became history research officer at the Australian Institute of Aboriginal Studies. Marcia spent five years as a senior anthropologist at the Central Land Council in Alice Springs before being appointed head of the Aboriginal Issues Unit of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody in 1989, writing the report, Too Much Sorry Business. She was a member of the Aboriginal Negotiating Panel for the passage of the Native Title Act through the Federal Parliament in 1993. And in the same year, her extensive work in the field led her to receive membership to the Order of Australia. In 1995, Marcia moved into full-time academia, becoming Ranger Chair of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies at Northern Territory University. In 2000, she was granted an audience with the late Queen Elizabeth II as part of a delegation to discuss the Crown's unfinished business in Australia and also commenced as the Foundation Chair of Australian Indigenous Studies at the University of Melbourne, a position she continues in today. In 2010, Marcia delivered the Mabo Lecture, Native Title, Poverty and Economic Development. In 2011, she was a member of the Expert Panel on Constitutional Recognition of Indigenous Australians. In 2012, she delivered the ABC Boyer Lectures, The Quiet Revolution, Indigenous People and the Resources Boom. Marcia is a Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia, a Fellow of Trinity College Melbourne, an Honorary Fellow of Emmanuel College at the University of Queensland. In 2016, she was honoured as a University of Melbourne Barry Rad uh, Redmond Barry Distinguished Professor, and in further recognition of her place as one of Australia's most respected Aboriginal academics, in 2017, she was appointed the first Associate Provost at the University of Melbourne. In 2019, Marcia was appointed as co-chair to the senior advisory body of the design process for a permanent First Nations advisory body to parliament. And throughout that process has continued to be a strong public advocate for the advancement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Deputy Chancellor, on behalf of the University of South Australia, I am pleased to present Professor Dr. Marcia Lynn Langton AO for the honorary award of Doctor of the University in recognition of her distinguished service to the community. Thank you, Professor Hughes Warrington. On behalf of the University of South Australia, I confer on you Professor Dr. Marcia Lynn Langton, the honorary award of Doctor of the University. I want to thank Tom and Marcia, and I want to thank the Deputy Chancellor, uh, John. It's been a real honour and a privilege to welcome you all here this evening and to welcome our newest honorary doctors. Please welcome our doctors. <laughs> I think we all recognise that there are challenges ahead over the coming months in relation to the work that you've shared with us tonight. It's been a long path for both of you and I think it's important for us to all remain optimistic about the possible outcomes and the biggest thing we can be is to be allies to you at this time. We're fortunate to have you both providing such considered, compassionate and generous advice to all of us and we want to 
give you the best wishes for this period and also, also to Aboriginal communities out there, many of whom this will be a traumatic time as these discussions take place. Thank you both again. Thank you to everybody to, for attending tonight, including the people joining us via streaming. On behalf of the Hawke Centre, we look forward to seeing you at a future event. Thank you. <laughs>